Surgery works on precedent. Every operation ever done can trace its roots to the one before. The ritual passing on of skills from master to student, repeated every generation as new surgeons are accepted into the fold. What worked before and what didn't work before are tied into the latest developments, relentlessly driving progress as surgery moves forward into the postmodern age. But how did it all begin? At what point in time did surgery, and in our case neurosurgery, have its origins? The answers are knottier and more surprising than you might think. In this series, we're going to be tracking the development of neurosurgery, from its first conception to how it's practiced today. We'll be traveling through time and across the world, paying homage to the various cultures and various masters who helped modern surgeons treat patients better than ever before. Remember, if you like the videos that we make for you, subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss out. Hold on tight, it's time to take a step back into the past. Eight thousand five hundred years ago in prehistoric France, this is the Neolithic era, coming towards the end of the Stone Age. The pyramids haven't been built yet, and woolly mammoths are still roaming the earth. Though humans are starting to domesticate livestock and settle down in small communities, they're still by and large hunter-gatherers, and hunting big game means big injuries. Neolithic people were like us. They were capable of inductive and deductive reasoning. So it makes sense that Neolithic man was able to grasp that severe injuries to the head and the body could result in death, be it for themselves or an animal. Various shattered bones from this era are testament to this fact. But what's interesting is that skulls from this period of time, about 10% of them have got signs of holes being drilled into them, an injury whose frequency cannot be explained by simple trauma. More intriguingly, many of these holes were in males and show signs of healing, indicating that the victim appears to have survived their injuries and lived to hunt another day. What could explain such a miraculous recovery? Let's familiarize ourselves with what has happened here. These skulls have been trepanned. This word is derived from the Greek word trypanon, meaning borer. This is literally the removal of a piece of bone in the skull, typically exposing the dura mater, the covering of the brain beneath, and conducted with a trephine, a cylindrical blade. From the archeological evidence that we've seen, it's thought to be the oldest operation ever recorded and is a practice that has actually been widespread throughout human history. Evidence for trepanation can be traced back far and wide, from Europe to China to the Andean spine of the South American cultures, as well as the varied cultures of the Mayans and the Incas. In fact, over 1,500 skulls have been found throughout the world bearing marks of trepanation. William Osler, one of history's eminent physicians, said about the procedure, Surely we can surmise that intractable headaches, epilepsy, animistic possession by evil spirits, or mental illness expressed by errant or abnormal behavior could have been indications for surgical intervention prescribed by the shaman of the late Stone or Early Bronze Age. We all know that there are numerous pathologies that can impact on the brain. So trying trepanation against well-known diseases, which of course have occurred in prehistory for them to exist as well today, is a logical step. Since we know that people survived the procedure for long enough that their skulls healed, whatever these primitive physicians were treating did get released, at least in some cases. So why the preference for males? Yes, women and children also show signs of trepanation, but nowhere near to the same extent that men do. Here, the theory of the late Dr. Plinio Prioreschi comes into play. He was a medical historian who had always warned of neglecting the past to the cost of the future. And his theory of why trepanation was conducted is perhaps the most convincing yet. One piece of evidence is particularly useful. On many of the trepan skulls, there are those where bone hasn't had the chance to be fully removed. Accompanied by evidence of healing, Prioreshi surmised that these people must have either woken up during the procedure 
and gone on to live for a significant period of time afterwards, either with their problem resolved or not. This theory ties in well with the idea of Neolithic man being a hunter. If they could administer blows to an animal's head, it stands to reason that an animal could do the same to Neolithic man. When significant trauma is delivered to the head, there's a significant chance that an individual would lose consciousness. Boxing matches where someone wins by knockout is a particularly good example of this. And if it's significant enough, the victim could of course die from cerebral edema or some form of massive brain bleed. It's in the more minor cases, what today we would call concussion, where Priyareshi's theorem comes into play. If a man or woman was hit on the head and knocked out requiring trepanation, it didn't matter if the operation was completed or not. If they woke up, it would have been considered a success as they were revived instead of being left for dead. Since men were more likely to do the hunting, this explains why trepanation is much more likely to be reserved for these people, as if they woke with minimal complication, they could go back to the hunt and continue to provide for their families. In the absence of time travel, we'll never be able to say for certain that that's why trepanation became so widely adopted, even though it's the most compelling theory. Either way, its persistence is a primordial example of evidence-based medicine in action. Through anecdotes of hundreds of injuries, the skill of trepanation was passed down through the years and conducted across multiple countries. For many, yes, it was a death sentence. We need only see skulls that don't have evidence of healing to surmise that at least some people died during their operations or afterwards. For some, however, it saved lives. And now, trepanation has the unique distinction of being both the first operation as well as a modern staple, the craniotomy. Craniotomies observe the same core principle as trepanation, though modern medicine has changed how and when they're used. Where once they were conducted with sharp toothed blades, they're now mostly done with precisely shaped drill bits that prevent tears of the coverings of the brain or prevent the drill from going through into the brain. Moreover, it's now almost unheard of for mental health problems to be treated by surgical intervention. We can only too quickly forget the practice of psychosurgery lobotomies, widely practiced in the early 20th century America. Instead, trepanation or craniotomies are routinely used to release and relieve intracranial pressure coming from brain tumors or hematomas or blood clots, the very injuries that would have been most useful to treat back in the Stone Age. I know this was a rather quick exploration of the first ever operation and indeed the first ever neurosurgical operation to boot, but I hope it sparked some curiosity in you to go ahead and explore the history of the field of neurosurgery for yourselves. But if you want to see more videos like this, please like and subscribe to the channel and let us know what you think in the comments below. During this series of videos, we're going to be jumping forward civilization by civilization to see how neurosurgery has developed through ancient history. It's going to be quite a journey and I do hope you're gonna to wanna to join us for it.